Menendez brothers hoping for a new trial. They are going to find out uh, what happens uh, in November when uh, the district attorney has a hearing uh, with the brothers. It could be a new trial. It could be just strictly, you served your time. We're going to reset into you. You're done. Many members, more than two dozen uh, of the uh, Menendez family and friends, including, including Rosie O'Donnell out in front of the uh, L.A. courthouse this last week, protesting and having a press conference begging for their release, saying they've been through enough, the abuse of them being in prison for all these years. They have served their time. Joining me to discuss, Eric Faddis, defense attorney and former prosecutor. Eric, um, so much attention on this case uh, from the Netflix movie and the documentaries. And, I mean, it's been a buzz now for about a year uh, with talking about the new evidence that's come to light, including the uh, accusations from Ray Rosilio uh, of uh, Menudo claiming that Jose had uh, violated him as well. Where do you think this goes? Uh, is there enough evidence there now? And are we in a different enough place to go, yeah, they've served their time? You know, I think th th these cases are an illustration as to how the changing of cultural and social ties can really impact even decades old cases. And I think we're getting to the point where some something's going to and I think that um, the men and his are well postured to uh, seek resentencing, and that might be great. This is um, a case where it, it has so many tendrils to it as far as who might have been violated here by Jose Mendendez. We know now about uh, the, uh, the Menudo member. We've heard rumbling from other members saying that they're willing to come forward uh, if, if need be. Um, but there is still the argument that is out there of the boys that, you know, look, um, you could have come forward right away. You didn't. Um, you went out on the spending spree, did all this stuff. Um, but you could also look at that and argue, look, these kids knew nothing else at, at that point in time. Yes, they were technically adults, but were they really mentally adults after suffering all of that uh, torture, if in fact it is true that they were molested by their father repeatedly? Um, and then suddenly they have the money. They're just they're trying to cope. They're trying to live a life. Uh, there's a lot of angles that can be argued here for the behavior of the brothers rather than just being rich, spoiled kids that decided to kill their parents for the inheritance, which, again, I've always thought was kind of a weak argument. There's, there's no, if they were a happy family, nothing was going on. There's no reason these people would have done this. Totally. That, that uh, like, financial motive was never overly compelling to me. Uh, but when you look at the fact that it, it appears the Menendez brothers had a good amount of love for their father and, and for their mother. And who wants to come out publicly and say, uh, you know, my father molested me, especially when you have a deep uh, reverence for him. Uh, so I think that there were some explanations as to why that information came out when it did. And I think that those uh, are understandable, especially considering the Menendez brothers' age. Well, and also, if we look at what they've done in the prison system over the last 30 years since they've been in there, they've been described as exemplary prisoners. One of them has actually made it basically his life's goal to help and work with victims of sexual violence uh, at a younger age and help them try and work through it, try and, and come to some sort of terms and find some peace with it. If you were someone who did not suffer sexual abuse and sexual violence as a child, why would you then spend the next 30 years of your life advocating for it and, and trying to help people? I mean, there are people who do that, who didn't suffer it. But, I mean, it, it seems like it obviously holds a big piece in this in, in his heart of, yeah, I, I, I best thing I can do now, I'm assuming I'm never getting out, is I'm going to try and help other people, which is, is what he did. I would think that would be taken you know, into account it, it as well. It certainly seemed... Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, it, it certainly seems sincere to me, and it seems like a weird thing to devote decades of your life to if it didn't happen. You know, I think some other people might argue, uh, hey, this is just a really sort of long game they're playing to try to get out of prison. Not necessarily my view, but but I think some people uh, who want to see them remain in prison hold that view. Does, if they do get released, does that set a precedent for any other cases? I mean, this is a rare setup, you know, rich kids murdering their parents after all these years of uh, the accusations of all this abuse. Uh, there's other people, I don't know how many, um, but there's certainly other people who have murdered parents or murdered somebody after claims of sexual abuse. And if we look back to the 80s and the 90s or even the 70s and how that was handled, does this open the doors for more appeals, even if somebody doesn't have an appeal, just a revisiting of cases from back then 
based on the way that uh, society kind of thought and the way that we treated this and the way we judged them uh, by kind of putting our heads in the sand going, that doesn't happen to boys, clearly does. Um, are, are we going to see other cases revisited? Maybe not as high profile, but but just others. I think that's very likely. You know, um, you look at the defense of like battered spouse syndrome. Whereas where a person had been abused for so long that, you know, in the moment, perhaps the the uh, um, pers- the decedent didn't present an immediate threat, but just the cumulative effect of all of that trauma caused that killing. I think that that principle is translatable to this scenario where, yeah. where a person has been abused sexually over the course of years. And I think that um, courts have not always allowed that evidence in, but it sounds like they're sort of warming up to that idea. And we could see a lot more cases being reconsidered. I think a big one uh, with that, the, where it does translate over this idea that, you know, was pretty prevalent in the 70s, 80s, even into the 90s. Hell, there's still people that believe it today that a husband uh, couldn't rape their wife, um, that you're married. How could this ever happen? That's not a, it's the same way like boys don't get molested by men or father. It's like, no, that shit happens. I'm sure there's a lot of women who snapped and got sentenced quite harshly for those sort of crimes in the 70s, 80s, and 90s um, because they were raped repeatedly by their husband, because they were violated, because they were treated like dirt without any sort of respect, but because it says you were married, somehow that's an acceptable thing. Um, It clearly is not, but I would think a lot of those cases due to this may get some reconsideration. What's your thoughts? Oh, certainly, yeah. I think that, um, you know, as... Um, society and and the prevailing trends and viewpoints uh, change and evolve over time, that affects the court system. Now, the court system is kind of reactive, and sometimes Mm -hmm. it takes a while for that effect to be realized. Um, But certainly, as we change how we're thinking about a particular issue, especially abuse, um, that is going to have ripple effects throughout the court system and throughout even old cases. Yeah, it's going to be very fascinating. I think it's as it's going to be an interesting one to to watch maybe some justice take place here uh, fairly uh, and then also to see where this goes affecting other cases that, again, didn't have the wisest of choices made because of the times that the uh, judgments were made in. It'll be very fascinating to watch. Hey, thanks for checking out the video. Be sure to follow us wherever you download podcasts, and especially Apple Podcasts, where you can get advanced episode and premium content on our premium channel right there. Also, be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss any breaking updates on the stories that matter to you most. We're on TikTok, X, Instagram, Facebook. Just search Hidden Killers Podcast with Tony Bruschi, and you'll find us right there. Again, thanks for watching.